You're listening to the All American Actors Podcast, Episode 26. In today's episode, I'm talking with lifestyle and entertainment television journalist, Katherine Eisman. She's going to share with us her incredible journey as a broadcaster and give you some amazing tips on how to really shine in an interview. That's coming up next. Ready to go behind the scenes and learn what it really takes to build a sustainable career as a working actor in the U.S. film and TV industry? Join me, Katherine Beck, your All-American Accent Coach, as I give you the insight and inspiration to take action on your career. Learn my best tips and tricks to performing with an American accent and hear from working actors and other industry professionals to give you a comprehensive overview of this biz we call showbiz. This is the All-American Actors Podcast. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to start off by giving a big shout out to Kate Ryerson, who says, I love working with Catherine as an actor as well as an accent coach. She is brilliant in what she does. I highly recommend this podcast. This is exactly what every actor needs who wants to master their American accent. I absolutely love that you are loving this podcast, Kate, and you can see the great value in these episodes and helping you with your American accent. And hey, if you're out there listening and you're loving this podcast as well, go ahead, do me a favor, head over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review just like Kate did, because in the podcast world, these reviews are like gold. They help us get seen by Apple, which means more actors can find the great value in these episodes as well. So if you can take like 30 seconds, scroll down on my podcast to where it says review, click the five stars, write a very short review about what you think about that episode or the podcast in general. And then when you do, you can get featured as our star listener of the week. So do me a favor, take a brief moment, click the five stars and leave us a review. All right, let's talk about my guest who is on the podcast today, Katherine Eisman. She is a two-time Emmy Award-nominated newsreader, presenter, and reporter. And she's also an international best-selling author. She has worked in the U.S. and Australia for over 15 years with extensive experience in presenting and producing news, entertainment, current affairs, fashion, and lifestyle programs all across the U.S. and Australia. Now, Catherine started her career in New York City when she joined NBC's Today Show as the chief features reporter, which made her, and this is incredible, the youngest on-air reporter in NBC history and also one of the very few Aussie journalists to work in U.S. television. She then went on to head the fashion and lifestyle coverage for E! News, and that's where she received two, not one, but two Emmy nominations for her work. And she has interviewed almost all the top celebrities, including George Clooney, Jerry Seinfeld, Reese Witherspoon, Nicole Kidman, and Oprah Winfrey, to name a few. Catherine is also a best-selling author and an entrepreneur as the founder and creative director of High Heel Jungle. Wow, now if that isn't impressive, I don't know what is. I cannot wait for you to hear this interview, so let's get it started. Welcome, Catherine. Love your name, Catherine Eisman, to the show. Would you like to start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself? You've got such an incredible journey that you've been on in your career. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Love your name. Um, do you know what? It's been, it has been a really interesting, and I think the word journey is actually very much appropriate because, you know, I started off, um, I grew up in Sydney and I studied at UTS, studied journalism, communications. And then I wrote my first book, How to Tell a Man by His Shoes, while I was still at uni. I was modeling and writing this book and studying, less studying actually, <laughs> more the other two. And before I graduated, I mean, I think it was, the, I think the day after I finished my final day at uni, I went to New York on a book tour. So the book ended up being a bestseller here and published in like 14 or 15 countries now but I didn't really have much of a book tour planned other than me just going to New York which I'd been during my semester break and did an internship at Fox News when I was I think 19 and I was I had this I got the New York bug and I just 
it's either for you or it isn't. And for me, I finally felt like I made sense. I found a city that resonated, that had as much energy, more energy than me. So I felt energized by it and ended up through, you know, series of just kind of amazing things. Obviously the book was a bestseller, but I didn't have many connections there. I knew one person. I didn't even know where I was going to live. Ended up going on Good Morning America. Ended up going on Today Show and then getting offered a position, which they kind of created for me on Today uh, in New York for NBC. And then I do stuff for the 5 p.m. news and the 11 p.m. news. And really just been a, a real deep dive into the life of a journalist and someone kind of handing me the keys to the city because I got to interview politicians and cultural game changers and I used to cover every show of life from the tents at New York Fashion Week and and all the different trends and 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 human interest stories of you know tragedy and people turning that around and it was just the most extraordinary opportunity where I I got to pitch ideas produce them write them go out me and my cameraman shoot them come back and you know write them sit there in the edit bay and then come behind the desk every every morning and then often afternoons and evenings presenting them. Uh, and so that was really how my life as a journalist kind of started. And after about five years in New York, I moved to LA and ended up being head of fashion lifestyle for E! News, which was really exciting and very different. And I wrote my second book. I, I came back for one year where I was face of Arena TV here and wrote my second book, How to Tell a Woman by Your Handbag, and would, would be writing columns for Men's Health magazine and Clio magazine, which was relationships and then style string based on the philosophy of psychology of fashion and, you know, working for Access Hollywood and Channel 7 Sunrise as the entertainment correspondent for about seven years. And finally, a pandemic and just the fact that I wanted to be closer to my family brought me home. So we just came back end of last year and I'm back in Sydney where it all began. Oh, wow. What a journey indeed. I'm so curious because you said that you were a reporter. So you started out pretty much as a reporter for NBC and you were in your bio, it says you were the youngest reporter in NBC history. That's incredible. How did you do that? Because <laughs> that's not an easy thing to do to get that as a reporter on NBC, you know, and the Today Show is such a massive show. What do you think it was about you that got you that job? Yeah, the number one show in the number one market in the world, you know, so in the most competitive, you know, arena, which was breakfast television. So it was, it was, inc- I mean, it was incredibly, it was amazing. Do you know what? I remember I came on as a guest talking about the book and they got a really great response. The viewers were coming, you know, and they don't often respond unless they hate something. <laughs> and and they were they said, oh, who is this person? We, we really like her. You know, what is this? And so I, my news director said, oh, do you have any other ideas? And my executive producer, I said, yes. Actually, it was, my, it was actually my executive producer first, Nancy Hahn. Who gave, who gave me a shot. And I said, how about these 400 ideas? Because I literally have so many ideas. I say to my husband, like, oh my God, I put this in the world. Otherwise it's going to like, my head's going to explode. And I still feel that way. And then coming in and, and getting to do it. And they, and I do think America is very good at, they do take chances on people. And I remember a big reason why I, I left was I had some meetings here and I've always, and I would say ambitious. I've always had this desire to do things, to work, to be creative. That's much more. It's never been my, I'm never trying to be famous or make a lot of money. You know, that's always, always things that come or go, you know, but really to, to, to be fully utilized professionally. And I remember I had some meetings and, and people were like, oh, you're so young. You know, I was like 20, 21. And even though I'd got my book deal, three book deal when I was 19, so that was obviously extremely young. But in the world world of television, it's, it can be a little bit safer here and they do like to use the same people until, you know, f- and reuse them. And there's a, a bit of a fear that, you know, if they try someone new, it doesn't work. And, and America, and to, to its great, great credit, do like trying new things. They will take a chance on you. And they saw something in me that maybe I didn't even see in myself and they gave me a shot and they they didn't offer me the position straight away. I'd come back and do another report and another report and, you know, I'd write it all and they liked my writing style and they saw something in me and they ended up creating, I remember my news director, Dan Foreman, coming up to me and said, oh, I think we could 
get a position for you. And I think I had to, I think I jumped up and hugged him, which is not what you do in a newsroom. You know, it's all very professional. And I said, I'll oh, sit, sit down. And then he said to me, he's like, look, don't mention your age. <laughs> don't tell anyone your age, 21. And, and I didn't mention my age, you know, and, and that's how it Amazing. Happened. And that really set you off. And like you said, you have interviewed some really high profile celebs. I think I I noticed Oprah in there. I'm curious because a lot of our listeners are actors and they will have to be doing interviews at some point. What is it that you've noticed in, in terms of these real high profile celebrities that, you know, A-list actors and such, what is it about them when they interview with you that sets them apart? You know, the connection to the news reporter or their delivery or their presence within the interview. What, what have you noticed? I mean, everyone is different, but I will say that from the perspective of the actor you know, or celebrity, you know, talent or, you know, star, whatever, being interviewed, what makes a compelling interview and what, what, you know, a journalist goes in there and they often, I think, you don't think necessarily about yourself. I think that's a really good thing to do. Like as my, as a journalist, I'm not thinking about myself. I'm kind of really trying to meet them where they're at. And I think the same is also very valuable as the subject of an interview to know that they're there to they've got their job to do and so seeing them as a person as well just as you hope to be seen as a person and trying to give them something they just want to walk out of there and feel like they got something true and that was honest that felt maybe you haven't told every single person the same story because then it you know (laughs) when it airs on television it's a bit you know troublesome and just say okay this person's there to try and you know, interview me, they, they're curious about me and that's the job of the interviewer to get that. Let me connect to them and speak to them, you know, to, to kind of drop aside the ego. And I have noticed with these really big celebrities, you know, you, most cases they're the ones that are the least ego-driven. They're a bit more egoless. It's often the people who are kind of up and coming that think they need to act like a superstar it's that perception of like, I've got it. Well, this is how a star would act. Whereas when you get to the very top of that industry, you know, Robert Redford or, I mean, I mean, you name it. I pretty much interviewed probably 90% of, you know, the biggest stars of our time and they're, they're a bit egoless, you know, and even someone like Ellen DeGeneres, who's gone through a lot of hardships right now about, you know, her alleged treatment, but she experienced was very vulnerable with me and talked about, she was doing Finding Nemo and, and Finding Dory and all these kind of things. I think it was Finding Dory. Talking about what kind of person she was and her own insecurities and vulnerabilities. And when you present yourself as, as you are, as a human, it makes for a much more compelling interview, a more sympathetic interview. Um, and, and you're actually going to be more comfortable because you're not pretending to be something you're not. And I would say that just to get drop the ego at the door and speak to them like a normal person, even though that is hard because it requires a level of vulnerability, but that is what I find at the very top, the very top of, of your industry. And then so as an interviewer, are you, I guess, in a sense, trying to humanize the interview as well? Obviously, you have a job to do, but there's that feeling of connecting on a human level to the person that you're speaking to as well so that they feel at ease and comfortable having this conversation with you in awkward circumstances usually. It's true. It's kind of like you're on a blind speed dating because often they're sitting in the room and for people who don't understand how this happens, it's usually at a junket where the celebrity or interview, you know, artist or, you know, actor, whatever you, whoever it is that you're interviewing, let's say actor, is sitting there in this room that's been turned into a, an interview suite. And there'd be, I mean, God knows how it's going to be after the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but now it's via Zoom, you know, but either way, it's this kind of very disjointed thing. And they're sitting there for sometimes hours, maybe like six hours, they might go to the bathroom, have a lunch break. 
and different journalists like speed dating come in and either sit down opposite them or now post pandemic, you know, mid pandemic, I guess, will zoom in and come in and every and for five to 10 minutes, they, they've got someone else sitting opposite them on this kind of speed date and they ask questions, often the same questions. It's very tough for the, for the person being interviewed, to be honest, because they're trying to, th- they often get asked the same questions. They're, they have such a short period of time. Think of it honestly as if you were speed dating. It's like, how do you build that connection? You're often treated like a piece of meat, just they want to get what they want to get. Some of them want to try and get something a bit scandalous out of you, or they're just really boring, repetitive questions. So that's the kind of construct that, that, that most of these people find themselves in. It's the journalist's job and my job to make them feel seen, to make them feel connected, to relate to. And with Zoom, it's harder than ever, but there are moments to have humor before you start recording where you just kind of break the ice as if you were literally on a date. Like, how do you make them laugh? How do you let them feel, you know, drop their guard a little bit? So you can have a normal exchange with them Um, and also ask them something they haven't been asked 500 times before and also make, and I think people are very smart. I think actors particularly have a very high emotional intelligence. That's why they're good at what they do. They're able to channel different emotions and feel it. And I do believe that even via a Zoom uh, speed date like a junket, People can get a feeling of you. Are you authentic? Are you there to do a hatchet job on them? Are you not? People do feel it. And so to go into it with the best intentions is and, and let that be known in so many subtle cues, I think really helps them feel at ease because a lot of actors feel very comfortable in a character and much less so in themselves. That's why they've gone into acting. And so these people that are often the most famous have been feel comfortable hiding behind this, you know, an Oscar winning uh, character. But when you're asking them about their childhood or whatever it is, that's a totally different kettle of fish and people don't often realize that. So it's my job to make them feel seen to and ask questions I do a lot of research so I don't go in there. When people know that you've done the work, that you really care, you watch whatever they were in, you have your thoughts about that, I always watch everything. And also really research them as a person and don't ask them questions they've been asked many times before. There's nothing worse. I've been on both sides of this where there was one article or one interview that maybe had a little bit of a scandalous beat to it. And then every subsequent interview from a, from a lazy journalist just keeps on rehashing those same things. And that becomes like the, the hallmarks of that interview. Like, Oh, well, I would, would feel remiss not to mention it. And it's like, no, that's being covered. Don't keep on opening a wound, find your own entry point into something different. And that I can't stand lazy journalism where they just ask questions that have been asked before. Mm. And I think it's, probably more interesting for the person that's getting interviewed too to be asked slightly different questions as well like you were saying doing the research that's so interesting that you mentioned press junkets because that was one of my questions for you in terms of let's say you're a new actor and this is your first press junket and they're nervous and they're apprehensive and like you said most actors, and I know myself as an actor uh, as well, I'm so comfortable being a character, but less comfortable being myself and being asked questions. What advice would you give them going into something like that to help calm their nerves, connect, and perform really well in the interview? It's a great question because I think there are different compartments. I think there's one that's like on the I don't know if people do meditation, but I think something like meditation, if you're ever going to do it, I think that would be a really wonderful thing because I think it's a really good way to reconnect with yourself and just step back. And I always say, I always say, step inside, step back into yourself. And I think with all these people, you'll have a lot of people from the film companies and, and hair and makeup and, you know, and, and wardrobe and a lot of people around you and it can take you outside of yourself. So I think it's a really important thing even if it's just before you walk into that room at the beginning of the day and maybe if you have little breaks, just to have a little bit of kind of that mindfulness to reconnect yourself back into yourself because you can it can be very out external. So that would be one tip that I think, even if you don't do meditation, just to calm down, do some deep breaths and just ground yourself again. Another thing would be, you know, something it seems kind of superficial, but like Make sure you wear something that you feel comfortable in, you know, and I think that you have these people who are styling you in different ways and you can sit there. Imagine being on a first date in an outfit that you feel 
someone chose for you and you feel really uncomfortable in it. So you obviously want to look good and confident, but something as simple as that makes a difference. It really does make a difference. And in terms of the interview, I think you have to have a clear idea of like, I think it helps to really understand, have a good idea of like, what are the topics? What are the themes that I want to discuss? Because people are going to ask you about the themes of the, of the work you've been in. So, have, so don't be thinking about the answer for the first time in the questions, because they're going to ask you about that. What are the interesting things? You might even think of some stories in your own life that relate to it, because I often, journalists will often try and say like, how did you connect to your character? That's always like a key. And even if they don't ask it in such a classic way as that, having those personal insights into it, the ones that you feel comfortable sharing rather than you feeling on the spot because you're trying to make it up in that seat, in that quick, hurried interview. I think have those stories kind of to some extent, not how you tell them, but the stories themselves. So there's still spontaneity kind of in your back of your mind. And then also remembering that they're a person too. They might be working for NBC or Channel 7 or CBS or whatever it is, but they're just a person just like you're just a person who happened to be in this production. They're doing a job as well. Give them something, you know, treat them with humanity. Give them something as well, just as you would want if you arrived on set for your director and your cast to give you the, the space to do a good job as well. So I think if you have compassion for them, have a clear idea of what you're talking about, some story ideas, and then try and have fun with it, you know, have biggest stars in the world, whether it be, you know, The Rock or, I mean, I mean, some of the biggest people, they have an air of kind of spontaneity to them. They're enjoying the process. I mean, I've had interviews with The Rock when we're doing, I think it was Moana, and we were running over time. And, and then, you know, you have the people who say, wind it up, wind it up. And they're like, okay, no more questions, you know, the journalist. And he's like, no, we're having fun. I want to answer this. And he kept it going. And what happens is you, just like a date, you want the journalist to kind of fall in love with you a little bit. And that's what, there's an art to that. And I think that comes from enjoying it. You've also had actors where you can see that it feels like you're pulling teeth. They hate it. They're so uncomfortable. They really don't want to be there. And I think as a good journalist, you can get them out of that spot, but you don't have long to do it. And so to go in there with the right attitude, they're there to promote your work. Ultimately, they're there to help you get your work seen by more people. So people come and see your film. It's good for the film or the show or whatever. It's good for you and kind of view it through that lens that they're not the enemy. Oh, Wonderful. That's such great advice as well, because I was going to ask you, are there any sort of do's and don'ts for the interview? But I think you brought up so many great tips for the actor that they can really use. So that's very beneficial. One thing you shouldn't do is if someone asks you a question, like I had an interview with someone and very high profile and I asked a question and they were like, well, what about you? And that's like, oh, I've got five minutes here. It was so, and I said, well, you know, I'd love to tell you about it, but we you know, we're here, we're only have five minutes. I would love to hear you tell you another time. And I think there are people like will know, journalists will know whether like that person's a long talker or that might be a one, like a one line answer. And to be somewhere in between where you're giving them real content. So it's not just like one word answers like, yep, yeah, no, we can't do anything with that. But also we have other questions. So don't just like use up all the time answering that one question because that probably might have been an intro question to get you opened up for wait, the real one they want to know is number two, you know? So just be mindful of the time restraints as well. Oh, that's great. So being really conscious of the length of your answers. So not too short and not too long. And I think that's amazing advice because nobody really thinks about that until they get into that aspect of their career where they, they then have to go into these interviews and learn the whole process. And really, it's sort of one of those things you learn on your feet. But to be able to go into that first one and have just a few tips. Yeah, absolutely. Really be mindful of the time that you have. So and having that pre uh, that session with yourself where you think about some of the things you really want to say, like this is an opportunity for you to say what you want to say. There might be really interesting themes that you want people to think about, which is why you wanted to do the film in the first place or parts of yourself that you don't think the public knows that you want to share. So this is your opportunity to do that. So have that organized a little bit ahead of time and then allow space for spontaneity. Amazing. So Catherine, what's next for you? So now you're in Australia. That's a big change to where you were before. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's great. I've, a lot of people say, oh, how are you dealing with it? I'm like, I'm dealing with freedom very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like we, our family moved. So we're in... 
West Hollywood and which is where all the you know the riots occurred and and a lot of the protests and we I got my husband and I got married in Palm Springs and we always wanted to live in Palm Springs but we never you know for a time and we but we never you know work was always in in LA so that wasn't possible and we decided we're like why don't we just everything's sharp this my I've got a now three-year-old but she was two at the time and a six-year-old now seven-year-old um their schools were shut all of my work for Access Hollywood and Sunrise was done uh remotely so via Zoom my husband can work from anywhere our neighborhood was kind of shut down the restaurant and I said why don't we just move to Palm Springs and we rented a house there for two months and everyone thought we were crazy this is you know about a month into the lockdown and they're like, oh, you'll be back after a few weeks. You're going crazy out there. And then we ended up extending it for another month. So we moved out to Palm Springs for three months. We didn't see a soul. We were just literally, we were like the final, last survivors of Armageddon. We'd walk in the morning and evening, not see anyone on these giant desert streets. It was a magical time. We'd go swimming and I'd work at night or do my interviews at night or, you know, whenever it worked and then homeschool my kids. And cook 400 meals a day we didn't go to a coffee shop we didn't go into a grocery store everything was wiped down it was I mean it was a very as so many millions of you know hundreds of millions of people have experienced around the world it's just a complete alternate reality and then after about three months of that after and a month and a half being in LA we just said look you know what I think the the writing's on the wall I think the universe is telling us it's time to come home and so you know my parents you know I've been away since I was 21 and I wanted them to spend time with their grandkids and it was, we just decided, I think from one week to the next, I was like, that's it, let's do it. And then to get the, my kids Australian citizenships and do all that kind of stuff. And, and we just arrived and we did the two weeks quarantine and then, and then now it's okay. Well, what can I do? You know, just what can I bring from all my millions of hours of working and re- working, you know, at such a high level, learning from the best people in the business, you know, what can I, how can I bring that to Australia, which has become such an exciting new hub for, for television and, and content, especially because of all, you know, it's fairly open com- comparatively and, and do that here. And so I'm developing some shows, which is very exciting. And so I've got two shows that we're developing. And then I also have a sock company, which I've called High Heel Jungle Socks, which I would wear, it came about because I would wear my socks. I worked, you know, I interviewed the biggest designers, the biggest style influencers in the world for so many years. And I was fascinated and written a book about the psychology of fashion. I really felt that like items of clothing, which are often deemed as kind of superficial, are anything but because they're a visual manifestation of whatever's going on internally. Like why you chose that item to wear. It's not about whether you're fashionable or how much you spend or it's about the, the decision-making process that is occurring on a often subconscious level that manifests self through you purchasing something and walking through life in those items. And I think it's such an amazing access point into who we are. And I felt that, you know, we do with shoes and I thought, what is the one area of fashion where people would do not get the chance to express themselves that could be really fun, that could change your outfit in a second without costing a lot, and that was socks. And, you know, people think of socks as the most boring thing in the world, like don't get me socks for Christmas or whatever. And I thought socks could be so much more. So High Heel Jungle was born from that idea, and I started wearing them on all my film junkets, interviewing people. And, I mean, I have everyone from Zoe... Kravitz to I mean I mean I, the biggest stars in the world stopped me uh, and and asked to put on my socks in the middle of the interview I'd say stop it what are you wearing these are the coolest things I've ever seen and so I started making them for me and also making them for the people I was interviewing because I would and all the makeup artists and all the people behind the scenes would also want to buy them and other journalists and so that's how High Hill Jungle was born. It's this kind of elevated fashion sock brand that you can wear with everything from cool sneakers to open to Birkenstocks to heels, boots, and it's just a bit of a game changer. And no matter what you're wearing, that's the item that people will comment on and stop you and say, where are they from? What is it? And uh, so we started at Fred Siegel, Ron Robinson in the US, and then now we're the number one selling sock brand on um, like Urban Outfitters, Free People over there. And we're just on the iconic here in Australia and we're the like best-selling fashion sock brand here and just doing so well. And it's just so exciting to see this brand 
um, be embraced by people and, and people having fun. I feel like getting dressed every day should be a fun form of self-expression and not a chore. So that's what that's what that that's is. That's amazing. Well, I will definitely check out these socks. And so if any of the listeners want to check it out, what where's the best way for them to find them? So follow us. So my personal handle is Catherine Eisman, spelled differently to yours, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N, E-I-S-M-A-N. And then High Heel Jungle Socks is just that, at High Heel Jungle Socks. Um, and then you can go on to, there's a link there onto our website, highheeljungle.com. Or you can go into the iconic as well in Australia and purchase them there. And yeah, they're all amazing. Oh, Catherine, it's been so wonderful chatting with you and listening all about your journey, which is absolutely incredible and everything that you're doing and going to be doing in the future. And I'm sure our listeners really appreciate all of your tips on interviewing as well. And it's just been such a pleasure chatting with you. So thank you so much you so much you're amazing at what you do remember when you gave me American accent? that's right do you want to tell the listeners yeah so I um I've been living in America a long time but had never done an American accent and I was actually terrified and a, a role came came up and they wanted a journalist but but a CNN journalist accent and you Catherine helped me so much I remember our, we did a session and I was like embarrassed to to do my you're like give me let's see where you're starting off with and I was so embarrassed and I walked around I was in Byron Bay at the time on a family holiday and I think I spent the whole time just speaking with them you, you identified all these interesting things that I'd never figured out I just could hear how wrong I was but I didn't know why and you showed me and I ended up sounding exactly like you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I even recorded it for you, didn't I? You recorded it. You you became a big part of my, instead of my internal dialogue, <laughs> I just was doing your internal, your, you and my internal dialogue. And then I was having lunch with um, Natalie Portman and I was like, do you want to hear my American accent? And anyway, I was like, oh my God, what have I done? And Oscar, you know, anyway, but um. But it was, you were so great at what, you're so good at what you do and you make something that can be quite intimidating, really approachable. And it was, and I loved how you started by saying, it's not just the inflection and the way you pronounce the words, but the the energy behind it and the kind of place you're at mentally. And I think that's also so important as a journalist or as an interviewee to think about, like not just the words you're saying, but the energy and the thought the place you're in mentally that drives that because that's really where so much of communication actually happens. Um, and so that's another tip for people, but it was really helpful and you did a great Aww. job. So now I have, now I need to have an American accent. Um, I'm not bad. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Well, that was so nice to hear. And it was really wonderful to work with you on that. And really interesting too, because we really broke down the difference between reporting in the US versus reporting in Australia and how that relates to how we communicate. And so for me, it was really fascinating as well. So it was a win-win. It's true. In Australia, we're much more like, it's a little bit more questioning, you know, and, and in America, there's such a sense of complete owning what you're saying and in a, in a, it's a slightly different energy to it and it was quite fun and actually a good thing for us all to do you know to step into those different aspects of ourselves as well um through accent you you feel sometimes like a different person when you take on a different accent because you have a slightly different energy about it it's quite fascinating it's really fascinating oh well i'm glad you had that opportunity to jump into the shoes of an American reporter. And yeah, well, you know, who knows? You could be, you know, doing more acting now that you're in Australia as well. You never know. Thank you so much, Catherine. Wow, what a great episode. So many great tips here in the interview process. I really appreciate it. And if you're an actor out there and you're feeling inspired now, ready to do the work so you can get on that red carpet and get interviewed too, but you're feeling like, mm, my American accent needs a little bit of work. Well, I've got my free guide that's going to walk you through my step-by-step -step process on how to master the all-American accent, and that is the perfect way to start. It's yours. It's free. Just head over to katherineback.com slash accent. And let me know if you've loved this episode. Take a screenshot, share it with me on Instagram story, tag me in it at Catherine underscore Beck underscore. You can find me there. Got any questions? Send me a DM or let me know any topics you'd like to hear on the podcast. I would love to hear from you. And coming up next week on the show, we are going to cover how to slate your name for your self-tape audition. 
So make sure you share the show with all your actor friends, let them know what's coming up next week, and invite them to tune in with you and learn how to become an all-American actor so you can be the working actor you dream to be. Until then, go practice your American accent, and I'll see you back here next time.